All right, here's our third lesson, Prohibition, Nativism, and Intolerance in the 1920s. There's a whole lot here. Here's your snap chart. Let's get started so that we won't waste any time. We need to go back a little bit and look at some of the context of Prohibition, and that stretches way back into the Second Great Awakening in the 1820s, 1830s. There is a movement to limit or even ban alcohol and its consumption. In 1826, the American Temperance Society was formed in Boston. Uh, Lyman Beecher is considered to be one of the key founders of that uh, movement, and that is the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. In 1851, Maine became the first state to become dry. If you ever see that referenced in a document, it might be about a drought, but it might also be about prohibition and banning alcohol. Uh, founded by or pushed by a guy by the name of Neil Dow, uh, the father of Prohibition. Uh, it was in place for a few years and then it was repealed. But the movement is there. Notice that it is in the East. Most of this is going to happen heavily in the West when it actually comes into a consistent setting and or a permanent setting for a period of time. The 1969 Prohibition Party was formed. Uh, it's still around here yet today. Uh, and there is also, as we talked about before, a great amount of involvement with women in this movement, as well as all the other reform movements. But alcohol was especially important to them as it affected families. As we talked about before, Molly Hatchett uh, was, Carrie Nation was one of those key people, uh, president of the WCTU, and uh, they were pushing for it to become a national thing for a long period of time, although it only really starts in certain states out in the West, as we'll see. 1900, the Anti-Saloon League was formed. Uh, and again, as we mentioned before, a lot of this change was happening out in the West, as with the development of suffrage out in the West. Uh, the West team seems to be kind of that origin where of place geographically where a lot of reforms happen and work their way back to the East. Some states were completely dry. Some had it down to you know a, a limitation here, but open to it there. Uh, varying degrees of prohibition existed. You might be familiar with a particular famous movie. I know there's been a remake of it, but the one that was right around 1980, somewhere in the 80s, Footloose, the original with Kevin Bacon. I think that was the best. Uh, check that out. That was about a small town prohibiting a lot of things, primarily dancing. Um, the idea was that was going to lead to one thing would lead to another bad immoral behavior. Prohibition on a national scale, as we've talked about before, begins with the 18th Amendment. Due to World War I, Congress proposed it to the states in December of 2017, a way to conserve energy, keep ourselves sober so that we could be effective in working for the war effort. And by the time we get to the dates uh, the year after the armistice, it becomes a national amendment. The U.S. is voted dry with the 18th Amendment. But notice what it says here in the text of the amendment. After one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the importation thereof into or the exportation thereof from the United States and all territory subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. What is it that that particular statement does not include regarding alcohol. What's left out? Well, check that out a little bit later. It's enforced by the National Prohibition Act, also known as the Volstead Act. Every amendment has a clause in it that says Congress shall pass any law to carry out the amendment and execute it. Uh, there's only really 1,500 federal agents left to enforce it across the country, a small number. Uh, enforcement here by this act is set up to really be done by the states. And that is going to be challenging because in some regions, some places of the country, they're not into this that much. In particular, the east, the big city urban areas are going to have a hard time with it. One of my favorite shows from the 1970s, The Dukes of Hazard, kind of had this uh, thing about bootlegging of alcohol, making alcohol illegally. There was a dry county that uh, these particular boys lived in and they made alcohol and they ran it over to in their super muscle car to the other county to sell it and make some money. Uh, the origins of the muscle car really kind of here, speedboats and things of that nature, actually putting very high octane alcohol into the tanks of these cars to outrun and changing and modifying the engines of cars to outrun the law 
uh, was really what was going on here with this. Uh, and uh, the smuggling coming in was coming in from all over the place, Latin America, Cuba, the Caribbean, and Canada in big numbers. Uh, the consequences of this uh, really result in a lot of organized crime, as you're probably familiar. Uh, Al Capone being the most famous gangster and the mob making money off of alcohol and other things, uh, setting up uh, in particular cities, in this case Chicago, uh, a racket in which he had a distribution network of alcohol throughout the entire city and throughout really the Midwest. Uh, but really people pretty much ignored the law, especially in big cities and urban areas. In rural America, it was easier to enforce because people were more into it. It's where it really started. Uh, and so uh, organized crime and a lot of crime is a, a big problem in all of this. Uh, and it really was unenforceable. But consumption did decrease and then it increased. Why is that? Well, you know, they got after it right away and it was all of enthusiastic, a grand thing right after the war. But gradually people like Al Capone and common average everyday other people figure out how to kind of skirt the law and get around it. Right. And so it never really totally has a grand impact on people. People drank it because it was fashionable. It was a status symbol. Uh, they were attracted to the illegality of it. Uh, but it did become more dangerous to actually consume the stuff uh, because there was no regulation of it. It was all kind of made kind of off the cuff, off, uh, shoot from the hip kind of a thing. You never knew where the source was coming from. Uh, there was really no control over production. And quite often it was watered down. Um, excellent movie to check out regarding the hunt for Al Capone, The Untouchables with Kevin Costner. Look at that one. Sean Connery just passed away this last few weeks, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, other problems in far enforcement of it, there's our federal agencies, of course, and the states are supposed to be enforcing it as well, but nobody really was in charge of making sure that was happening at the state level very consistently. Crime does increase over all, over all and becomes more organized. The court and prison system becomes completely overloaded, uh, and public officials become corrupted significantly as well. There were these things called rackets that were established. For example, Al Capone would basically pay off a local law enforcement officer or all the law enforcement officers in Chicago to look the other way and let some alcohol go through. But once in a while, they would set up this fake bus, or it would be actually a real bus. They'd let them capture and break up some alcohol to show that they were doing their job, but they were getting money under the table. Juries were paid off. Al Capone went to court many times, arrested many times, but they he always got off because the jury was fixed, paid off, and or the judges were paid off as well. Uh, Al Capone, by the way, is only put in jail because of his not paying taxes on this, not because he killed anybody or because of alcohol, but because his income never showed any report of paying taxes to the federal government. So uh, that's going on. The government lost a source of tax revenue, right? When these things are sold, the states and or the federal government could get some tax revenue out of it, mostly the states, I believe, at this point in time. Uh, it does cost the government more to enforce this, so it's kind of a double negative that way. But at the same time, there was an impact or effect of people looking toward other things like opium, marijuana, patent medicines, and cocaine, other stimulating things coming into uh, the use of society at that time because of it. Uh, one of the other problems was is you could get a recipe and a kit to make alcohol on your own from the Department of Agriculture even. Uh, but largely people knew how to do it themselves anyway already. Uh, you could get it for medicinal use, a uh, prescription from your doctor, yet uh, it was still utilized in the churches for sacramental purposes. That was never affected, of course. Um, and uh, that is prohibition. So there is a significant moral effort to clean up the country, but morality, ethics, and the humanity of the country is really kind of going in a different direction. There is uh, a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, significantly so, and it's a different Klan than it was before. Uh, it spawned by the movie called Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. It was the first blockbuster epic movie in history. It was three hours long, and when Woodrow Wilson said it, he thought it was the greatest thing ever. Uh, you can check out his quote there, uh, but it's based on, get this, a book called The Klansman, a rom historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan. 
Klansman romance. I don't usually associate those two things together, but uh, there was in the film basically this notion that, you know, before the Civil War, slaves and their owners lived in kind of a state of harmony. There was this natural social order that was structured just so, and it really was a perfectly good society and it was set up with a purpose to kind of keep everything in order. Well, when the Civil War is done and that slaves are freed, there becomes a disorder in society and the Ku Klux Klan is there to try and keep that order or restore it. Uh, in other words, also keeping African American freedmen in their place, uh, people who they deemed or were portrayed in the film as immoral, uh, over-sexualized, uh, tended to attack and rape young women, uh, young women, which was portrayed in the film, and then the Klan would come to the ride to the rescue, that kind of thing. And this really was a, a big, a big film uh, that influenced and did romanticize the Klan uh, for people across the country. Uh, economic hardship is driving this. There is, as we've talked about before, a fear that the old culture is being overrun by immigrants, foreigners, the new immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, it, part of this is a reaction to World War I and the Red Scare, make a note of that there as well. Um, but uh, there is a push push to try and try and preserve what is seemingly being felt like it's being lost. Uh, in 1925, there was a huge, huge uh, demonstration of, of uh, as you see there, uh, and parade protest of Ku Klux Klansmen in the nation's capital. And so uh, by 1924, there's four and a half million members, and it's no longer a secret society either. And it's no longer the Klan of the South. It's a Klan of wherever there are minorities who are seemingly taking over or a threat to the old society. As that great migration happened, the clan and clan membership rose with it. The greatest growth and the, some of the greatest numbers of clan membership were in the Midwest. And notice that is the industrial Midwest where those industrial and Northeast where the industrial jobs were and clan membership exploded there. All right, so it's not just the clan of the South anymore. Uh, so our nativism really is on the rise here because of World War I, because of immigration, and this is something that's not new. It's been around before. The American Party, no nothings. We talked about them before. Really anti-Irish, anti-Catholic. Uh, the American Protective Association was formed in 1887 out of fear of this new immigration influx, and they were very anti-Filipino, uh, Philippine annexation. Uh, uh, in their message because they did not want Filipinos to be part of our society and system. Uh, they didn't fit. Um, the Klan uh, was very concerned that the school systems would be overwhelmed by private Catholic schools and our public school systems. Uh, that uh, would be overrun and become uh, the minority in things. And then whenever you see this little uh, fellow here with the hat, that bishop, that's a reference to the Catholic Church. Uh, and their targets now are not just freedmen and African Americans. They are Catholics, Jews, Slavs, Japanese people, uh, anybody that is not white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. All right. And uh, by region in the country in the South, they're focused more on the, you know anti uh, African Americans. Uh, in the Midwest and the West, it's all about the Catholics. Uh, in the East, it's about the Jews uh, who are a dominant uh, outside group living there. Uh, other groups: the Communists, Pacifists, Evolutionists, Internationalists, Bootleggers. The Klan was very pro alcohol. Uh, prohibition, uh, and immigrants were not pro prohibition. So that's another reason why they didn't like immigrants. Um, as, as a result of this concern for society and society being upended, as we talked about with the Reconstruction, there is uh, a lot of violence to keep uh, these particular people in line. And it's just not uh, African-American people being lynched. Uh, there are numbers of other people being lynched as well that we'll get into in just a second. And so with this violence and, of course, the poll taxes, literacy tests uh, and, and such, uh, keeping people uh, out of the system legally, uh, there is the violence. So what are the, what is the greatest concern for African Americans in the post reconstruction time period into the year 1900? Not so much voting. It's more of living. A site to check out just created here in the last few years. Uh, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama is, uh, a, a museum of that chronicles the history of lynching in the United States. There's some other websites out there that portray where it's at, uh, where it's dominant. And of course, the map shows that here. 
not again just only in the south uh, some lynchings uh, hard to take hard to see it's very much it's not a hidden thing it's very much a public thing you could find postcards like this one uh, with people writing home to their neighbors or friends uh, you know dear john this is a token of a great day we had in dallas march 3rd a negro was hung for assault on a three-year-old girl i saw this on my lunch hour i was very much in the bunch you can see the negro hanging on the telephone pole um, somewhere at night, if you were a white person and you did the wrong thing, you could get lynched. Um, you never know. Um, this one particularly in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, it's really crazy to see some of the pictures and the imagery there. People here look like they went to a Sunday, uh, you know, Sunday Sunday church, or they were going to go to Sunday church after the hanging. Uh, bring your kids, bring your family, um, things of that nature. And as far north as Duluth, Minnesota, my home state, uh, you could find events there as well uh, involving uh, people who get lynched because they are accused of supposedly being uh, responsible for an attack on a white girl or a person. Uh, they're broken out of jail and they're hung in the middle of the street. That's what happened there. You can check that out online if you want to dig up some more details on that. And so it, it's broad. It's nationwide. It's not just in the South anymore, although you would find it more commonly down there. But it does happen more and more in the 1920s. And so, you know, in our new 20th century here, we have the formation of a civil rights movement that is growing here, the NAACP in 1909, uh, and uh, the formation, as we talked about before, in the middle of World War I, or as a response to civil liberties issues, the Sedition Act, um, conscientious objectors, pacifists, anti-war speech socialists uh, being, uh, 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 their rights and due process being infringed on them because of the Sedition and Espionage Act, the Pol uh, Palmer Raids, all that kind of thing is what prompts the formation of the ACLU to represent anybody through the courts, doesn't matter who you are. But also in 1929, there is an organization that's still around today, and this is important, uh, the United Latin American Citizens uh, union is formed called LULAC, right? And it's in response to the violence and the lynchings against Mexican Americans and Latinos in the South who tend to be very heavily the migrant workers doing work in fields. Uh, you'll check out some of this information in these primary documents in a little while. Uh, but this organization was formed because that particular population is very spread out in small towns and rural areas and they migrate, they move. And so they're not connected, they're not able to connect or organize because they're constantly on the move with the seasons and the harvests uh, and this for organization is formed to protect their civil liberties and rights and they are attacked and they are the top focus of lynchings as well. The response to the foreign influence also gets into the development of, in our 1920s, some of our most significant and intense immigration laws. Notice what this port cartoon is portraying here. Our door is open. We need to close it to undesirables and their little head there is portrayed as a bomb. Anarchists? The Immigration Act of 1917, not the only one that was passed up until about this point in time, but it was uh, passed uh, passed uh, by an override by Congress, even though it was vetoed by President Wilson, and it was going to impose literacy tests and bar immigration from the entire Asia-Pacific region. Right? The American Federation of Labor was strongly in support of this. Other labor unions that we talked about before uh, in support of this, uh, this Asia region being shut down. Uh, the act also here being portrayed on the right as being something that's going to help filter out the undesirables right through a screen and block the ones that we don't want there. Uh, 1921 is the one you really need to remember and the one that comes after it. The emergency, notice the name, the Emergency Quota Act is going to set up a quota system. Right. So for immigrants from each nation, uh, and this is going to be in force until 1965. So what it says is we're going to do some math here. Three percent of any group already in the United States based on a previous census in 1910 could be in could come in in any one year. So 3% of, let's say, Germans coming in, in that were in the country in 1910. That's how many could come in in 1911 from Germany. Right. So now recall what, and this is important to understand, recall what region of Europe were most Americans historically from? The second act is the 1924 National Origins Act. This particular act increases the formula, intensifies the formula. It reduces the quota by reducing the percentage that could come in in any year. And then they went 
back in time to the 1890 census. And when we go back in time in the 1890 census, there were fewer Southern Eastern Europeans in the country than there were in 1910. So 2% of a smaller number in 1890 meant in any successive year after 1924, a much smaller portion of people from Southern Eastern European uh, Europe could come into the United States. So this in particular uh, is very much a law that is going to benefit Northern and Western European Protestants, right? And white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the largest portion of our population, and it's going to limit and discriminate Southern and Eastern Europeans. And notice the change in the charts right there. All right. So this is also going to make sure that there is 100% exclusion of Japanese uh, people coming to the United States. Don't forget the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, this did not include people coming from Canada or Mexico because we really liked our Canadians for the most part, and we liked the Mexicans because they were migrant work labor for us in our agricultural south. And so uh, that cheap labor was important. Another sign of nativism and uh, xenophobia, uh, fear of foreigners, again, kind of being triggered by our Native Amer our Red Scare and the anarchist movement uh, is the Sacco and Vanzetti trial in 1927. Uh, this particular trial is uh, centered on two Italians who one was a shoemaker and the other one was a fish peddler. Uh, they were convicted of robbery and murder uh, and they admitted to being anarchists and atheists but basically being guilty by association or being you know uh, evidence presented by somebody saying they saw them there, uh, which wasn't substantiated, um, and other and flim flimsy evidence overall, they were convicted of the murder and they were executed. Uh, research and reviews of the case and the evidence point to them being not anywhere involved in this even remotely. And so hysteria resulting in and fear resulting in uh, this kind of an event. Not the next, not the last time it's going to happen either. Wait till we get to the 1950s, Red Scare. So we're in the Red Scare Part One, Red Scare Part Two. We'll see that happen again. Now our national identity is really changing a lot. 1920 is a very pivotal year here. Uh, modern culture, new ideas are combining with the growth and influence of urban cities and life. Uh, it's threatening traditional fundamentalist religious views and conservative views uh, in American society. Again, that you know we're losing our identity here. 1920 is the first time we have 51 percent of the population living in an urban uh, area. So when you think about politically, when it comes to voting in Congress, who has more votes in Congress? It's always by population in the House, right? Senate doesn't matter. Everybody gets two. Urban areas are getting more powerful. And rural America is fearing that it is kind of like the South, right? In a way, right? In the uh, pre-Civil War time period, can't do anything about the House of Representatives anymore. So uh, they're really afraid that uh, government is representing them anymore, and our farmers are part of that a little bit too. But uh, this fundamentalism uh, is uh, based on family, church, uh, tradition, uh, 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 the idea that, uh, again, as I mentioned before, they're being politically outnumbered by those who aren't moral or those who are represent more modernist thinking in urban America, urban society, uh, has more crime in it, has all these immigrants, all these foreigners coming in, uh, and uh, they believe uh, in particular that America is going to be uh, overrun by this. And this is a time uh, in the 1920s where, where science is becoming more a part of society and more of school curriculum. Uh, and it's challenging the old fundamentalist beliefs of the origin of things, the origin of people and the world and all that, right? And so that is going to bring us to a very big trial. So immoral behavior, urban society, corruption, crime, that's what it represented. It's East versus West, a little bit like that Granger populist movement and the Eastern rich big businessmen and bankers, rural versus urban that we talked about before in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. It's still here. Again, we can kind of see that again, a little as we've talked about in class before, a little bit in our election cycles here, urban uh, blue versus uh, Republican red uh, 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 counties and, and regions of the country, states in the country. Uh, religion versus science was the kind of the issue that was was coming up here. Uh, and the pinpoint of this becomes uh, 
in a small town called Dayton, Tennessee. Tennessee had, in right around 1924, 1925, had passed a law banning the teaching of evolution in schools. Right? Well, I don't have to go into what evolution basically says, but it basically says that, you know, I guess I will. They get it gets into you know, people are derived from and evolved from from uh, other animals, and uh, fundamentalist Christians did not like that at all. Right, and so uh, a particular organization we talked about encourages and was looking for somebody to break the law. They said we would represent you and protect you. This John T. Scopes wasn't looking to do this, but they said we'll represent you and we're going to encourage you to go ahead and break the law. If you get arrested, we'll take care of you, your car costs, and all that kind of thing. So he does, and uh, he gets arrested, and this becomes the trial of the decade. Uh, the Famous fellow here, William Jennings Bryan, the populist from Nebraska, the great commoner who lost the presidency, president, presidential race three times. Um, uh, the Democratic uh, populist candidate uh, is the prosecutor for the state of Tennessee saying this guy needs to pay and what he's teaching is completely wrong. It's immoral. And this particular case is a symbol of that clash between uh, the two sides here during this time. They basically said that what he's teaching and what evolution does, it affects the minds of our youth. And that if our youth are being told that they're basically the descendants of apes or other animals and monkeys, that kind of thing, then we're no different than any other animal. And so therefore, you know, what's the point of having a family? Uh, family and the family structure and monogamous wedding uh, marriages and that kind of thing uh, goes out the window. And so uh, the idea then, of course, gets, uh, you know, thrown out to that, of course, you know, the book of Genesis uh, point, uh, uh, says that God made uh, heaven and earth and made man and made woman, and they weren't evolved. He, he made them, right? And so it didn't fit with the fundamental views of the Christian side of the country. And so the whole nation followed this on radio. Uh, as we mentioned before, the 1920 uh, election was on radio for the first time. This was on radio, too. And in the end, Scopes uh, is found guilty. Uh, the case that was brought before the court with his defending uh, lawyer, a guy by the name Clarence Darrow, said it was about First Amendment rights, First Amendment speech, freedom of thought, all that kind of thing came out in the trial. Um, but they said, no, you broke the law, and they give him a $100 fine, and Brian is totally angry because he should have gotten more than a hundred dollar fine. So in a way it was kind of a moral victory in a way uh, because of the punishment and the consequences. But uh, it was uh, a trial that uh, again highlighted the, the, the tensions between the old thinking and the new thinking, modernist, modern thinking, science versus uh, Christianity, old ways of thought. Uh, and uh, the uh, Protestant faith, Catholic faith, any Christian faith out there that didn't agree with that. All right, so that is our day. There's a lot here, I know. I'm going to get right to letting you make hay on the left-hand side there for yourself. Read also your prohibition article for the left-hand side to make sure you review and detail that. And keep making the hay. <laughs>